thank you very much for your invitation uh, to let me speak today. Um, I'd like to say right from the start that I'm going to be fairly short and brief. Uh, partly because um, I prefer to listen to fairly short and brief speeches myself. And I'm also recovering from a case of the flu. So the, if anyone can hear what I'm saying or can't understand my accent, please let me know and I'll try and make adjustments. The other thing is I do have a habit sometimes of saying things which not everybody agrees with. Now I come from an anti-racist organisation myself and I'm here to support the activities of this group as well. And if there's anything I say which some people don't agree with, I would say that's part of the spirit of communication and interaction which gives rise to further discussion which as far as I'm concerned is always a good thing. I don't want to repeat uh, too much of what Peggy already said, but when I learned um, that the organisations here were involved in struggling against overcoming racial discrimination and prejudice, I kind of thought back to the 1960s, because I can go back that far, for better or worse. And I remembered after a series of very violent racial incidents in the United States, um, where the civil rights uh, workers had been murdered, where uh, black students in, um, in Mississippi had been, been killed on the old Mississippi campus, that a well-known black social activist called Rap Brown, who's now deceased, uh, attracted a lot of established media criticism when he said, violence is as American as cherry pie. And in some senses, I would want to say, and maybe not everyone would agree, that racism is as Canadian as maple syrup. And why would I say something like that? Well, I'd say we've only got to ask the Aboriginal peoples, for example, who had their land taken from them in the way that Peggy described, whose children were seized and sent to residential schools, who experienced the worst impacts of European colonialism in North America, in Canada and the United States. And you may say, well, why do you bring all that up? That happened a long time ago, the Indian Act was 1876. Well, I bring that up because a lot of these problems have never, never been properly addressed, let alone solved. The Aboriginal peoples are still fighting for their treaty rights and outstanding land claims issues, and children are still recovering from the effects of residential schools. If we go back, for example, to, to some of our Chinese Canadian descendants, we asked them about racism. They would tell us about the, the head tax that was imposed on early Chinese immigrants. $500 at the time. God knows how much that would be in, in everyday terms. Why was that a fact? Because the government, the Dominion government of Canada, wanted Chinese for one reason, to exploit their labor on the Canadian Pacific Railroad. They didn't give a damn about anything else. They didn't want their wives and children to come. That's why the Chinese Immigration Act excluded any Chinese up until 1948, after the Second World War. So we could ask them about racism. We could ask East Europeans about racism. We could ask Ukrainians and Poles uh, and Russians. The Immigration Act in 1919 was changed. The regulations were changed to make it easier to deport East Europeans, the Central Europeans. Why was that? Because of the Winnipeg General Strike and because they were seen as a national security threat because every East European, it was assumed by the government, was an agent of the Bolshevik Re Revolution, which had taken place in 1917. Everyone was racially profiled the same. Does that strike you as fairly similar to what's going on today? Very similar in some ways. It was the East European threat. And there were no, no exceptions made. Russian and Ukrainian newspapers were, were, were put out of business. They weren't allowed to publish political parties and organizations were made illegal. So that takes us on to the East Indians. The East Indians would tell us about the Continuous Passage Act, the only way that East Indians could come to Canada, as long as the boat did not make a stop at any other port. Virtually impossible. And when a, a group of East Indians did arrive in the Komagata Maru boat, dying aboard for lack of, lack of uh, drink and food, they were not allowed to disembark onto Canadian shores. And the same thing happened to Jewish refugees during the Second World War. Canada has the worst reputation of any of the Allied powers for allowing 
Jewish refugees persecuted by the Nazi regimes of Europe to come to Canada. That's a matter of historical record. We could talk about the Japanese internments in 1942. The Japanese were, again, bring that, that, that phrase up, a national security threat. How many Japanese were actually prosecuted and convicted of being enemy agents in Canada during the Second World War? I don't believe there was one. Not one. And yet how many thousands of Japanese people were interned, their fishing fleets on the West Coast confiscated without compensation. So it's not just interning people, it's taking their property as well. And so the story, so the story goes on until today. We have the new version of racism, which some of us refer to as Islam. It's a new, a new social ethnic group which is being targeted, Arabs, Muslims, and people of South Asian descent. So this is the, the contemporary version of this. And every generation in Canada has had to fight its own battles against racism. And every generation has, has in a sense, committed itself to the importance and, and, and significance of that. And we have made some important victories. But there is still, obviously, a lot of work to go on. So what brings about racism? And there's many different explanations. The psychologists talk about uh, the psychodynamics of uh, of distorted communication, and misperception, stereotyping and profiling. But in my opinion, the deepest, most fundamental root cause of racism has often been colonialism and the exploitation of land and of labor and of people. Colonialism in its various forms has resulted in racism over the ages. The racism against Aboriginal peoples, internal colonialism, the taking of land, the shunting aside of people into reserves. If you read the, the reports of the late 19th, early 20th century, you will find that people across this country, native people, were existing in a state of starvation, of poverty and misery because uh, of, of the, the taking of their land and livelihood, because of the, the infliction of alcohol and venereal disease. Colonialism had a lot to do with that. Today, colonialism has a lot to do with Islamophobia. Because today we see the growth of a new form of imperialism and colonialism. In 1992 in the United States, a think tank called the New American Project for the New American Century came into existence. And even before 2001, Dick Cheney, George Bush and others in the Bush regime had already decided that the invasion of Iraq was a very important part of their agenda. This is before 2001, before 9-11. And so it only took 9-11 for that program of the program of the new American century to be put into practice. And it took the form of a document called Rebuilding America's Defenses, RAD. You can Google it for yourself on the web. And it spells out the role of the United States in the post-Soviet world as the new policeman, as redrawing the map of the Middle East to ensure long-term security of energy resources. It means committing itself wholly to Israel, even though Israel has committed egregious violations of the United Nations Charter and Resolutions 242, the United States and Israel were one as a partnership in redrawing the map of the Middle East. And so it goes on. And under Bush's war on terror, this translates, in a sense, into putting together any form of resistance against colonialism, against occupation of a native land. Any form of resistance is labelled as terrorism. Not just Al-Qaeda, because interestingly enough, after 9-11, the Hamas organization in the occupied areas and Hezbollah in Lebanon both condemned 9-11. If you believe it or not, it's a fact. And the government of Iran sent a letter strange though it may seem today, of condolence to the American government, Iran. So this is what happened. Just their culture. But with the new American uh, aspirations towards global empire, the need for a new air bases and military bases in what the United States now calls the Greater Middle East, which isn't just the Persian Gulf, but it's Central Asia, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan and so on and so forth, the Caspian Basin, 
where there are trillions and trillions of proven reserves of natural gas and, and of oil. This is really what's causing the new occupation. This is what the Americans really have in mind. And the victims of this, the victims of this, as you know, are all over the Middle East. The victims longest, I suppose, are the Palestinians. But the victims are now in Iraq. The victims are in Afghanistan, which is a, a natural energy corridor for a pipeline, which would take pipeline from the Uzbekistan through to Pakistan. The victims are in Kashmir. The victims are in Chechnya. Because none of, none of our governments will want to say that what the Russians have done in Chechnya is brutal and degrading and savage atrocities. They, ra they raised the city of Grozny just to basically turn to ruins and then they murdered the only Russian journalist who was serious about reporting these atrocities, Anna Politskaya, dead, shot, goodbye. So who are the victims? Well, unfortunately, part of the victims are those of us who come from those countries and those of us who support in every way we can the struggle against this racism. Islamophobia has become one of the side products of the great so-called war on terror, which in fact is simply Bush's doctrine of regime change according to American imperial intentions. So I could go on, but to conclude, my feelings in terms of offering some suggestions for struggling against the problems of racism, for resisting racism and for overcoming it, are kind of twofold. One, I think we need to strengthen our sense of what we understand by citizenship. And secondly, we need to deepen our understanding of what we call democracy. What do I mean by strengthening citizenship? First and foremost, in Canada, there should be no distinctions between us, between those of us who are formerly citizens and those of us who are permanent residents. Or even if we are guest workers or refugees, once we are living in this country, paying taxes, we obviously have a responsibility to abide by the laws, but we also have the right to get protection from those laws and from the Constitution and Charter of Rights. That's really important. There is no one who is illegal. We should stand together because in the past racism has always succeeded when the government has divided one set of, of, the, of, the, of the working people from another set. We should resist that absolutely. Everyone who lives here obeys the laws of the country but is also entitled to the protections uh, of the Charter of Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. Why is that a big issue? It's a big issue because of the 2001 Anti-Terrorism Act. It needs to be changed. It targets religious and political uh, as the main targets motivating acts of terrorism. And acts of terrorism is disruption of services. It's not necessarily killing people. It was rushed through after 9-11. It's a terrible piece of legislation. It allows the government and what I call the secret state to do whatever it likes with so-called suspects. So the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2001 definitely needs to be changed. We need to strengthen our citizenship by getting it changed. No-fly lists. What do we know about no-fly lists? Well, people like me probably don't have to worry too much unless I've been involved in fights with customs officials in the past. But those of us who come from Middle Eastern or Arabic or Muslim backgrounds can be taken off of flights or refuse to go on flights without being told the reasons, without being able to appeal. So no-flight lists is another example of the kind of institutional racism which is creeping in to legislation and so-called government protection of passengers. And as recently as 2007, there's been an update to no-flight lists, which I think is called identity screening procedures, which will make it worse, will make it worse. And it's been challenged by Amnesty International in this country, along with some other organizations. So these are some examples of how we can fight together as citizens to, to prevent the discrimination which is inevitably going to come out of some of this legislation. So that's what we can do at home. What can we do to strengthen our citizenship abroad? Well, this is really important too. We need to take seriously our commitment to be global citizens. What does that mean? It means we have to hold our government responsible to uphold international law to start with and to uphold all the international treaties that it has signed on our behalf and in our name.
So it means, for example, in the present case, we all know about the detainee agreements. The government has finally had to expose part of itself that it did transfer detainees uh, who have been tortured and summarily executed and abused. Um, and it is now, in its own way, trying to sweep that under the carpet. And it took a long time, a long, hard time. And I know because I confronted the Canadian ambassador to Afghanistan, Sprawl, Dennis Sprawl, uh, last year. And he didn't want to talk about this at a meeting of the Law Society. But we still haven't got round to talking about other stuff where we are criminally responsible. We haven't got round to talking about collective punishment. And it's known that American troops in Afghanistan and Vietnam have subjected certain villages to collective punishment. We haven't really got round to talking about civilian casualties. And yet President Karzai himself has broken down and wept at news conferences talking about NATO destruction of civilian populations and villages. What part is Canadian troops playing in this? That's a difficult question to answer. Because the only thing I ever had in common with Sir Winston Churchill was his one statement that the first, first casualty of war is what? The truth. The truth. So if you want the truth about what's going on in a war zone, in the front lines, don't rely on the government. Don't rely on the armed forces and the military to provide you. You are going to have to do the work and independently research this for yourself. So we have to concern ourselves not just with the treatment of prisoners of war, but collective punishments. We have to concern ourselves with civilian casualties and also with coexisting with armies that are using banned weapons, both in Afghanistan and in Iraq. The use of white phosphorus by the American and probably Canadian troops, depleted uranium shells, hydro rocket heads, cluster bombs, landmines, the kind of stuff that we should have put out behind us a long time ago, and so on and so forth. So we should say that any government which it wants to be taken seriously in the world is a government which lives up to its international responsibilities, which upholds international law and upholds its international treaty obligations. So that's what I mean by taking global citizenship seriously. We need to take these things very seriously according to our own government. And don't forget, we have a Prime Minister in 2003 who said we should have been sending troops to Iraq. Um, it's documented in Hansard that Stephen, um, Stephen Harper wanted the Canadian government to send troops to, uh, to Iraq. Um, and as you know, Stephen Harper also, after the Israeli civilian bombardments in Lebanon, regarded that as a measured response. And after the Palestinian Authority elected in free elections that Jimmy Carter even endorsed, um, and, and to, to resolve some of the problems of, of financial corruption and whatever else was going on, elected a new government. And you would have thought Stephen Harper, who had been so concerned with the sponsorship scandal in Ottawa, would have welcomed a new government in the Palestinian Authority that so was going to sweep not at all. What did he do instead? He cut funding. He tried to economically sabotage any attempt of the new Palestinian government to, to get to work and to begin to create the viable beginnings of a, of a Palestinian authority. So that's what I mean by strengthening citizenship, both at home and abroad. And the second thing, by doing that, we deepen our democracy. Because democracy doesn't mean to me voting every four, every four years. It means coming together and working to put the public need in front of private greed. It means organizing on questions such as community tolerance and understanding, opposing racism. It also means fighting for affordable housing for the homeless and for the low income. It means protecting a health care system when American health care organizations are just waiting to move in on the privatization. It means criticizing the present government's attempt to get into a partnership, a so-called security and prosperity partnership, so as Americans have first dibs at our oil, so as to get that the oil needed for the war machine south of the border. It means all of these things, collectively organizing together. So, in a word, strengthening our citizenship, I think, is something which, if we do it seriously, 
can increase the likelihood of taking power back into our own hands. Thank you very much.